Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Nutrition and Stress panel. Um, like Billy said, it's not a successful event without technical difficulties. So here we are. Thanks again for joining <laughs> us. Um, let's, let's do a little intro. Dr. Karen, hi, good morning. Good morning. Ian, Julie, hello. Billy, good morning, how's it going? Dr. Rochelle, hello. And Dr. Judy Morgan, thank you so much, everyone, for hanging out with us today. Let's jump right into questions. What do you say? Sure. Sounds like a plan. Awesome. So with, with things happening and the whole COVID effect, our animals are feeling too confined and trapped, or they're starting to take on the energy of a human in a household feeling this way and maybe they start to show signs of stress overeating under eating how can we help dr judy do you want to start with this one sure well i think uh, part of our problem is our the our routines are so different from what they used to be so therefore it's very different for our animals and a lot of people are feeling stress. I know in our household, God forbid we start talking politics or you know whether things should open or stay closed. And as voices rise, you can see even our deaf dogs realize that there's a change in the energy in the room. And it becomes uh, very stressful for them, at, just like it does for us. And I, I think one of the things that we have to try to keep in mind, particularly if we have a lot of animals in the household, is that we need to keep ourselves calm and that includes going out for walks playing soft music turning off the stupid news and um, trying to stick to routines as much as possible get them out for exercise uh, and and try to check ourselves so that we're not stressing them and stressing each other out along the way awesome yeah and our animals they like routines it's they helpful do for them does anyone else have anything else to add you know, my thoughts are that I think sometimes we're not necessarily, especially with acute stress, we're not necessarily checking in with how we think we're, do we think we're doing okay, especially those of us that have worked at like trying to learn how to meditate and trying to remain grounded. We, I think sometimes we think we're doing okay. And yet our animals are the ones that are like, <laughs> you okay today? And, and I think the, probably the biggest things I've heard from my clients through, for over the last four months is. I had the opportunity to spend more time with my, ki my kids, two-legged and four-legged, and I'm seeing things I didn't know. Like there, I'm seeing more stress in them than I thought that they had. And I'm also recognizing that because I'm home more, there are, th there are training things I can work on. There are um, physical things that I need to be working on. I think that this has been an opportunity for us to reconnect because we've had more time to be home in our environment, but we're home in our environment with incredible cortisol. So I would say that intentionally doing things to reduce our stress hormones, cortisol would be some of the best things we can think about. And one of the best ways in my opinion would be walking, just moving our bodies, moving our chi, um, sitting stagnant, especially as Dr. Judy said, what, listening to the news or um, re in a state of fear can perpetuate stress hormones without us even knowing it. And then that's when our animals are like, <sighs> You got something going on. And so sometimes we're reminded to ground ourselves up because of our animals, but that should work both ways. And I think that just moving our bodies, even if, you know, if you're in lockdown and all you can do is walk six times to the left around your backyard and six times to the right, or just do stair work, you know, you can turn walking the stairs in your home into kind of a, a meditative ritual a, a couple of times a day. So you can find things to do around your house to help ground yourself out if you, if you can be innovative and creative. Thank you. And I, and I would like to mention as well, I, I don't know if it's, you know, it's kind of corny to say, I guess, uh, just in general, but being positive, I think is very, very important. And I think finding new activities, if you can, that you don't normally do. I'll, I'll give you a really great example of that. Um, you know, here in Philadelphia, I live, you know, kind of right in the middle of the city. And one of the things that you could do uh, during lockdown was go out and hike. And so we didn't ever find the time to hike before we were doing this, but you know, we were taking our small dog out for four or five mile hikes and that's getting her into creeks. That's getting her in the woods. It's getting her all that wonderful soil. Um, but it's just making us happier as a family. And I think it, even getting those outings once a week 
was a really big deal for us to be able to say, hey, look, we're going to forget about what's happening in the world. And we are just going to go out and be in an environment where you none of it matters. So I think I think new habits are, are really important. Awesome, Billy. Dr. Rochelle, I've got a question for you that pertains to the human aspect. Is there some kind of way that through all of this we can we can deal with with this emotional eating that kind of seems to be attached to <laughs> being in lockdown? Right, right. <laughs> emotional eating. Um, aside from lockdown, that's something that I know many, many people uh, suffer with, and it's something I I talk to a lot of people about. Um, you know. And emotional eating is really just, you know, using food as some sort of for some other purpose other than for fuel for a body. So if we're anxious, if we're stressed during COVID, um, if we're bored during COVID, um, all of these are reasons why we would actually emotionally eat. Um, when it comes to emotional eating, there are some things that you can kind of do to support yourself in the present moment when you're doing it, when you're eating. Uh, part of it is also going to be with emotional eating, because it's emotions, it's essentially about dealing with those emotions. So having some way of navigating how you do that on a regular basis is going to be really important. Um, so it's not so much like, you know, how when we, when we go through these phases of emotional eating, maybe it's every night, maybe it's all day long, maybe it's in the middle of the night, um, whatever somebody's routine or um, lack of routine is around eating, if you will. So really it's about, um, having a routine, as the other um, folks mentioned here in the panel, of doing something for yourself that you're going to be able to kind of check in with yourself emotionally on a daily basis. So one of the things that um, is often used in terms of emotional eating, which many people have probably heard, is of the fullness scale. So it runs from one to ten. So ten would be like that Thanksgiving uh, fullness of like, you ate so much, you're going to be sick, you have to go to sleep. Uh, and then seven, around seven is when your body is nourished and feels really well. And then four to five or less than that is generally some kind of a restricting or a starvation. And so the key to kind of doing this is to looking at um, being present when you actually are eating. So if you can form a little routine, and sometimes for people what I'll say is actually write a note and leave it on your table that tells you to pause before you eat. Mm -hmm. Pause before you take a breath. Take a couple of deep breaths while you're actually eating your food. Um, another thing is with portion control, um, people will often say, you know, okay, just bring a small little bit of food over to the table, but then you keep going back for more. Another part about that is you can actually bring that portion over to your table and then put the other food away, not just leave it on the stove ready to grab some more. Um, the other big thing is when, when you're eating is to only eat when you're eating. And that's a big one. So a lot of times with emotional eating, we're sitting in front of the TV. Um, we're talking to people about our emotions, whatever it is that we're doing, the, the idea is to really be present while you're eating. And these little things, I think it's important to note with emotional eating because emotions can run really deep and rampant and very unconscious in our system. It's really important for us to kind of work, like I said, on these little habits of being in nature and deep breathing and all of these things that kind of help you allow yourself to check in with your emotions more. And the more that you kind of have these habits, it's not going to usually happen overnight of, you know, pausing and deep breathing and portion control and only eating when you're eating, you know, that's not going to end emotional eating. It's everything else that's involved with it too. So it is in a sense, it can be very complex at first for people. Uh, but I think the good idea is just to start really small, write a little note, you know, pause, deep breathe, portion control, only eat when you're eating and eating as whole foods as you can. Because as soon as you start getting into refined foods or refined sugar, processed foods, um, it's gonna be even harder for you to stop because of the addictive qualities that these foods have, right? So that's another part of it. Um, one other note around emotional eating is there's generally three or four sort of roots of why we emotionally eat. Uh, the first one, which a lot of people are going through with COVID would be stress. So just feeling overall, you know, whether you feel alone or bored or what have you, so feeling overwhelmed. And the second is being sort of hyper vigilant, you know, going, going, going all day, super busy, and then needing something at the end of the day to calm yourself down. Um, 
another reason would be just self-loathing in any capacity, you know, not feeling good enough, not feeling worthy enough. Um, and then self-abnegation essentially. So kind of self-sacrifice to avoid offending, offending other people. So, so you can see it can be very complex, um, but the idea is just to kind of start small. And with emotional eating, you really have to dig into essentially, you know, what your emotions are, what you're feeling on a regular basis. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dr. Wilcox. Um, if anyone else has anything to add to that, or shall we, shall we continue on our journey? I was just going to say something really quick about when everyone's talking about getting out and Karen was talking about going down the stairs and Billy was talking about getting outside. Um, I, I've done a lot of stuff with dirt, like eating animals, eating dirt and things like that. But, but one, a couple of things that I said to some close friends um, that have, couldn't come, get out of apartments is getting kiddie pools and putting dirt in them and then putting them on their patio or the patios or their apartments that they couldn't get outside with the lockdown and just standing in it. Like I use it, I like, like earthing, you know, Rochelle's talked to me lots about that. And so is Karen just like get when you're stressed, get outside and stand in the earth. But if you're surrounded by cement, how do you do that? So, you know, just trying to, when you're allowed to get out, go and try and get some earth from even if it, try to get organic earth from like a, a nursery or something, put it in a little kiddie pool or whatever, get it out onto your uh, balcony and, and stand in it, like try and feel the earth, let your animals play in it. Just, just try and touch something that's, that's, that's alive. Awesome. I know Billy really likes that too. That All right. True. I'm a huge dirt fan. Yeah. So on to our next question. Our animals are, for, for the most part, loving that, you know, some of us are home and they're getting to spend more time with us. Um, maybe it's more of a natural pack atmosphere, but as things kind of start, our routines start to ramp up again, how can we help our animals through nutrition and otherwise to, you know, kind of get back on their routine and, and, and not feel strange when we start to leave the house again? Dr. Judy, do you want to start with this one? Well, it's interesting because I have this same conversation with people every fall. A lot of people like to get a new puppy at the end of the school year, and that puppy has been with the kids and the family all summer, and then all of a sudden, around here, it's the day after Labor Day, everyone leaves the house. And those puppies have never been trained to be by themselves. They've, they, they've never experienced being home alone. Um, so I think as things start to open up, we need to get our pets more back into whatever their routine was. If your pet was crate trained and you left them crated when you weren't home, particularly if you have a puppy, they've got to be confined in some way. You wouldn't leave your toddler home alone without some sort of control. Um, and I, so whatever it is that used to be your routine, you need to start moving back toward that. And it might take, because now they're, they're used to a new routine, it might take some things like flower essences or some homeopathics or uh, something to help them ease through that transition. I, I think that you need to start working toward it a little before you know that everybody's going to be leaving the house and getting them used to that a little bit. Um, so whether that's they stay in another room by themselves, a little, little more away from you, um, I, we're lucky in our house, there's always somebody home. Uh, but I, I think that people need to start planning ahead and don't just suddenly everyone leave the house <laughs> and you're on your own. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. How, how long should we kind of start to try to implement these, these routines? I think you've got to start at least a couple of weeks ahead of time. You, you've got to give them some time to start to reacclimate to what the new normal is. Well, new normal, we don't know. Nobody knows what that is, but um, getting somewhere toward whatever that is going to look like. Um, and if you've never left them home alone at all, it, a lot of people adopted new pets. People started fostering because everybody was home. And I mean, our shelter is empty because, and it's wow. a wonderful thing. But now we've got to do some training work 
to get those animals used to the fact that they might be spending some time home alone. Awesome. Dr. Becker, do you have anything to add? Is, is there anything else there? Those are all great suggestions. My, the one thing I would add is that if you can begin setting up some new healthy rituals now, like for instance, the morning walk that will tell your dog's eyes, hey, it's daytime, they get that blue light coming in, they're going to wake up, it helps with their circadian rhythm. If you can do, if you can begin the ritual of walking now, and you know, there's all different types of walks, there's cardio walks, there's sniffing walks, sniffaris, which is really that unbelievable intake of great smells where you let your dog just stop and smell everything. I, I say it's, it's like getting pee mail where they can, if they want to sniff a post for 10 minutes, you just bring your coffee and they sniff a post for 10 minutes because what you're doing is you're satisfying unbelievable innate, um, really proactive wellness. You're activating all their, all their healthy calming hormones and you're helping brain synapse and you're helping to reduce cortisol by letting your dog sniff is a great idea. So you setting up even 10 minutes in the morning and 10 minutes at night. So when you come home from work, you know, before work, you can do this and after work, you can do this. If you've got some healthy rituals that your animals can look forward to before you go back to work, that's one of the best ways that you can kind of transition that home routine into a consistent work now related back to whatever normal is, as Dr. Judy said. Um, I think that it's important to have positive, healthy, um, routines that you can use, including exercise or safaris or five minute training, uh, you know, quick training ep episodes around the house. I think it's a really great way to connect with your animals and provide some normalcy as things switch, as our schedules switch back to a more active, crazy, less home time environment. Thank you. Billy, what can we, how can we use nutrition to help us stick to these routines that Dr. Becker and Dr. Morgan said are so important as we get back to the new normal? Well, I think that, I mean, nutrition is the base of, of everything, I guess, in my opinion. So, I mean, if you think about the, the whole reason we're here is to, you know, in talking about nutrition and saying, you know, can food have an effect on how we feel? Well, of course it can. So we know it, it releases certain hormones in your body it, and certain chemicals in your body. But we all know as well that, you know, we all feel better when we're eating right. So we all know that if we're not eating the right things, if we're eating the wrong, you know, uh, diet, we're much more likely to, you know, get angry. We're much more likely to, you know, be snappy with someone. And, and dogs and cats are no different. I mean, we've all seen everyone, you know, I'm sure on this panel and, and watching has seen when they switched their dog to a raw diet um, and started to in integrate a lot of, you know, unprocessed foods they see their dog's behavior change completely. And they see them, oh, they're, it's not only they're acting like a puppy again in terms of their energy, but in, term, in terms of their actual attitude, we can see that change. And I think that's kind of a dual street there. One, it just goes to what people normally think about, which is the nutrient content. You know, my dog's actually, uh, my dog or cat is actually getting everything they need, you know, when you're talking about certain vitamins and minerals. You know, but also in going to um, Julie's point as well, you know, the bacteria part obviously is a huge part of it as well. So we know through um, mammal studies that most people think about how, you know, how bacteria, sort of how we affect our nutrition this way, meaning, hey, I'm really nervous, so I have a stomach ache. But now we're starting to see through science that it's actually, it's a this way relationship as well. So we can say, hey, you know, we know that microbiome can affect things like ADD and depression and, and, and you know, in people. And I think we can also relate that to animals and say, look, we're going to go through a stressful time and I'm going to provide you with as much good bacteria as I possibly can and give you the right things. And that should go a long way. Thank you. I'm going to move us on to some attendee submitted questions. Sandra, Carol, and many other attendees wrote in and they wanted us to please explain the safe steps in stress management and healthy gut control. Uh, there's a lot of conflicting info here. Julie, maybe you could start us off with this one. I had a prime example this morning <laughs> of, of, of gut and brain, uh, the connection between the two. I think, I think that um, just like what Billy was saying, that, that, there's more and more information all the time about our gut brain access or 
how our our gut is actually affecting our brain rather than what than our brain affecting our gut and um there's a nervous system actually in our it's in our in our gut we actually have this really cool little brain that works sort of independently from from our own brain and it's the nerve it is the nervous system that nervous system produces about 25, 95% of our serotonin levels. I'm actually gonna, I, add, I wrote some of this down cause I knew I would forget it. So I'm just gonna read it. You guys cool with that? Yeah, okay, good. <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, so the, because somebody did ask that about the, I was looking even down below about the gut brain access. So what I wrote was the nervous system of, the, of your brain and your gut are connected by a neural pathways. But what's cool is that the enteric nervous system located in the gut and is a nervous system that acts somewhat independently. Just one thing, just one simple little thing that this gut brain does is produce 95% of a chemical that I'm sure everybody's heard about, which is called serotonin. Um, so serotonin is a neurotransmitter that control and stabilizes mood. And if its levels are altered, it can contribute to chronic depression, anxiety disorders, cause massive sleep issues, chronic inflammation, um, diseases in the gut, which then lead to all kinds of other crazy immune system breakdowns. But what's pretty fascinating, like Billy was saying, is that the common treatment for depression with people is something called an SSRI, um, which is a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor drug. That's what they actually use in conventional medicine. So when we look at the, that if, our, if your dog, your cat, your horse, a person, it doesn't really matter, if the gut microbiome is not functioning correctly and that, that gut nervous system is not allowing the serotonin levels to, to balance properly, Da everything is going to feel the effects of of brain health, right? Like our the br your brains aren't going to work properly if the gut's not working. So not not only do they go back and forth, but more and more research that we're seeing with um with with the microbiome, we're understanding that a lot of our stuff hits our gut first and then goes to our brain, not just not just vice versa. So in like inflammatory bowel disease, let's say, they're saying that, that the levels being not, not, the levels of serotonin can start because you're nervous about something. But if it's not, if it's not actually balancing through the gut, then, then the two go together. So they're looking at treating depression, anxiety, and, um, and IBD specifically with with the microbiome and for dogs i know karen you talked about this too um uh they they've done a study with uh bifidobacterium longum it's a it's a particular species of it but they're using that um in veterinary medicine now instead of using drugs for anxiety and depression um you know, dogs with separation anxiety, all that stuff. So I think it's, it, I think when Billy's talking about, you know, what, it's almost like what comes first, the chicken or the egg, like does our, does our stress and our, how can we, how can we not be so stressed? Well, I think that part of not being stressed is whether our gut microbiome is actually functioning correctly. And if it's not functioning correctly, we can, we can meditate, we can do all of these amazing, amazing things, which then helps our brain functioning and our central nervous system in general. But we have to work with it as a balance. And we're, we're finding more and more research how important the microbiome is and how directly related it is to stress and anxiety and all kinds of, all kinds of brain health. So it's really important. And I think we're gonna put, at some point, we're gonna put some strains and species into the chat where, where they've been doing research with dogs and with, um, with people on specific, specific ones that will relate, relate to that, right? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Julie. Anyone else wanna to add to explaining the safe steps in stress management and gut control, healthy gut control? I just, I, I just wanna mention that I think 
sometimes we forget that there are food, there are mm -hmm. foods for our bodies, and then there are calming foods. And I think that, for instance, tryptophan. Uh, is the calming amino acid. And there are some foods that are higher in tryptophan, like turkey. Everyone's heard that whole saying, turkey makes you tired. Turkey makes you tired because it has higher tryptophan. And tryptophan does a great job of feeding into the calming. It, you know, it helps convert your dog or cat's fight or flight response from that, from that sympathetic amped up to the parasympathetic calming. And likewise, there are some foods that contain a lot of glutamate, or even as, as Dr. Rochelle mentioned, Highly processed foods contain additives, flavors, a bunch of extra things that are added in that actually create an excitatory response because of their glutamate levels. And glutamate converts to glutamine in your dog and cat's body, your body as well. And then glutamine is cool as long as your body has the genes and the enzymes to, con the, they're called GAD. Uh, genes. And a lot of dogs and humans are missing them, which means they can't convert high glutamate, glutamine foods to GABA. And GABA is our calming amino acid that does the opposite of, of you know, amped up, wound tight. GABA helps calm the, the nervous system down. And so just feeding foods that don't create a stimulatory effect for yourself and your animals could be incredibly beneficial. So switching from highly processed treats to cubed or chunked turkey, that's an easy, simple step that actually helps with the calming effect in the body versus an amping up. And sometimes, uh, especially during stressful times, thinking about intentionally feeding calming foods. So it, foods that are higher in the B vitamins. So you could use some cube liver. Organ meats are really high in B vitamins. If we start thinking about nourishing our bodies to include a healthful stress response or to foods that we know that intentionally diminish stress, I think that now's a good time to consider swapping excitatory foods for calming foods. That, and it, it makes total sense. To, every, it's so cool because everything really does connect, right? So when we're eating when we're feeding inflammatory or exciting foods or sugars and things like that to any body, you're going to produce, you're going to unbalance the gut microbiome. Sugar, we're going to increase, um, increase yeast. We're going to increase different, different bacteria in the gut that then will then reduce the ability of the access, right? So it really, it, it is so interesting how it just completely goes a full circle. And when Karen, when you were saying about B vitamins, they've shown that B, um, B bifidum is actually one of the species that helps our body absorb our B12s and our, in our different B vitamins. So it, yeah, it, and even just what Billy was saying too, about how we feel better when we eat better. And it's, it's just, it's just really, I know, but then we all just crave junk. <laughs> can I, can I, I, I would be remiss if I didn't mention, by the way, because you're talking about B vitamins, that there's another really great source of B vitamins, and that's uh, fermented foods. And those B vitamins come from B bacteria that are fermenting the food. So, Dr. Rochelle, Dr. Morgan, do you have anything to add? Um, I it's a little bit like Julie was saying, it's the chicken and the egg in one sense. I tend to always think emotions are the root cause of most things. Um, but, you know, you can have um, a disrupted gut flora that's causing anxiety and stress, and you can have stress that's causing a disruptive gut flora. And just looking back at that, you know, foundation of, of what happens when you're stressed and how your whole system really shunts energy away from your digestive tract when we're stressed. You know, you're going into that fight or flight stress, uh, um, stress which most people know what that is you know and it's that that survival mode and so the energy will leave your digestive tract in that state and then you if you're eating when you're in that state then you're not going to have optimal digestion or assimilation of your nutrients so even going back to that you know the step of of pausing and breathing and like and taking time to sit down and eat instead of eating while we're on the run eating in the car eating in front of the tv um, all these things can help. And it's sort of the, be, the beginning process of the digestion to work on that, um, not eating when you're feeling stressed because it's not going to help you digest your food any better. Right. Dr. Like Mor Sorry, go ahead. go ahead. Dr. Morgan, can you add how we can use TCVM to calm and comfort? Maybe it can be used with nutrition? Absolutely. Um, so one of the things that, and this will 
uh, relate to personality of the animal and the person as well. So I'm a wood personality, which means I hold everything in my middle. I have liver chi stagnation, and that's where the energy all gets stuck. And if I eat the wrong foods and I don't help drain that liver chi and move it down the road, it comes out as a shen disturbance, which is the crazy mind. Uh, we can also see that with uh, a blood deficiency. And what's really interesting is listening to uh, you know, the gut-brain axis that we've been talking about. It plays into things that are good for the liver. Dark leafy greens, they're, they're high in B vitamins, but they also help support the liver, support the blood. Uh, things like asparagus and radishes are going to help drain the liver and keep things more balanced. Dandelion greens, they're a dark leafy green high in B vitamins, and they also help drain the liver. The, one of my favorite things to use for, for periods of stress or if we're getting that. So with liver chi stagnation, that's when we're going to see the anger coming out. Uh, so we see it in some pets and we see it in some people. So they're the ones that tend to be maybe a little bit explosive. I see a lot of wood personality German shepherds. They're great guard dogs and they're really good until you put them in a corner and or a box and tell them, no, I want you to do this. And then they say, I don't think so. Um, and there are actually, so we can treat that with food therapy. We can also use acupressure, acupuncture. Um, a lot of those wood personalities don't really like acupuncture, but they will put up with acupressure. And so I can tell you on the hind foot, if you have one of those dogs who tends to get a little angry, you think they have a little liver chi stagnation on the hind foot between the first two toes, kind of right at the top of the web, you can do a little acupressure there. And that is a really good draining point for the liver. Um, and then the other thing that we'll see is manic behavior when we have a heart blood deficiency. So those animals are going to have a pale tongue. They might be a little dry and they're, they kind of can't control themselves. And so we want to support their, their, their blood and help with that deficiency. So we're going to feed things that are good blood tonics. So it might be liver, it might be beef. And, uh, think of anything that's kind of red or dark leafy greens are going to help with that. Awesome. Thank you very much. I, I would like to say that um, this whole conversation of chicken and egg, uh, I, I must say that chicken eggs or eggs in general are also very high in choline and choline is a fantastic neurotransmitter. So whether it's the chicken or the egg, feed chicken eggs now because they help with choline. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Thank you, Dr. Becker. Thank you, Dr. Morgan. Billy, this one's, I'm going to start this one with you. Um, Julio wrote in and a couple other attendees and they asked about weight and emotional health. Um, can you talk about how we start off on the right foot when it comes to nutrition and, and decreasing normal everyday stress? Um, yeah. So I guess I don't understand. What do you mean by weight? Well, we're worrying about like overeating, like this emotional eating that we're talking about that revolves around the pandemic. How do we... Dr. Dr. Morgan talked earlier about it, bringing home a new puppy or a new animal. How do we start off on the right foot with nutrition to avoid stress? Oh, got it. Well, I mean, I mean, if you're talking about, you know, bringing home a new puppy or, or a new kitten or something like that and starting their nutrition, there's no, there's no important, more important time to actually start their nutrition. Actually, there is a more important time and it was when the mother was pregnant and when actually let's take that one step further when the, before the mother was pregnant. Uh, it mattered probably more what she was eating during that yeah. process. But the thing is, you know, you're getting your puppy and you or kitten and you can't control any of those factors. Um, it sometimes you can, but most of the time when people get them, especially if it's from a shelter or something like that, you can't necessarily control those factors. But what you can do is control exactly where you start your puppy or kitten. And I think, you know, that is obviously, you know, I don't have a cat personally, but I do know that um, I make the joke whenever somebody says, how do I get my cat to eat raw food? I say, get a new cat. Um, <laughs> so, uh, and what I mean by that is if you, if you have a puppy or a kitten, get them into those good habits, especially if they're a kitten, because then they'll actually know, oh, this is food. And they won't get into that habit of, uh, you know, only eating something like a highly processed dry food or something like that. And the way you want to think about that is when you get your puppy or kitten, what are you developing? You're physically developing their body and their brain and their habits around eating. So I would say, you know, if you're getting your, 
your puppy or kitten at eight weeks or something like that, that first, you know, eight weeks, to 12 weeks and on there is really the most important time for nutrition. So not only should you be feeding obviously raw, you know, unprocessed foods, but, you know, I always advocate for things like raw milk, raw, you know, eggs, all of these reproductive foods that are going to be more biodiverse than other foods. So you can make sure that you're filling in the gaps when it comes to, you know, any missing nutrients. Awesome. Anyone else have anything to add for that one? I have a question, actually. Sure. <laughs> um, because, you know, we're like lockdown starting to get, you know, ease off and stuff. But in case it happens again, which, which is what they're speaking about, what would you guys say in general? Like for me, I've been telling all my friends get you know, live in apartments, go get, go get dirt, right? Get dirt when you can, because people are using it now to plant gardens. If you can store some to get it out on your balcony. If, if it happens again and we can't get and people can't get to grocery stores as much and we can't get to, and, and that revs up again, do you guys have any suggestions of, what people can get to have at home that that is really good for their for their dogs and their cats and for for ourselves like as far as as you know just just things that you would have sort of in your cupboard that that we can reach so that we're not stressed because i find that sometimes when people get when when something like this happens a lot of a lot of our our um, a lot of stuff kind of goes out the window because we're, we're trying to do our best and we can't find what we're supposed to get. And, and so even more stress adds onto that because we don't think we're doing it right. So, or we can't get it. So I'm, I'm wondering if we can sort of have a list or things to, to, to kind of have on hand or do you know what I mean? To try and help people not be so nervous about not being able to feed the right things and stuff if this, if, if this happens again. Well, I mean, I, I, if, I, if, I don't, if you don't mind me starting, I actually have a good habit that people can kind of get into, I think, for themselves. Um, and it's one of the things that being, so living in Pennsylvania um, and having direct access to sort of what I'm going to suggest has been really great during, you know, all of the lockdown kind of stuff. And that was, you know, we have the, I have the ability to drive, you know, uh, to a local farm and several local farms and we can pick up our food there. And so, um, when we drive down the long driveway down to, uh, name drop, uh, Jersey hollow farm, and we go into their little farm store, there is no, you know, one, as far as a stress reliever goes, you know, if you can actually leave the house and go to, uh, somewhere like that one, you're not seeing that that environment, you know, socially there because you're out in the country. Um, you're and two, you're getting fresh air. But three, you're supporting your local farmer. And what a great opportunity to eat more seasonally. Um, you know, in the case of being in Pennsylvania, of course, you know, you can get raw dairy and things like that. But they also have vegetables. And and so a lot of these polyculture farms that are doing eggs and they're doing all these things. Not only are you going to get better food, but you're also going to be able to support a, a farmer specifically and get into some more healthy habits because I think we could all eat, you know, more seasonally a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. Any other, any other things that we should keep prepared in our cupboards for? So, yeah, I would agree with, with Billy if you have access to that, but if you're living in a city and you don't have a lot of freezer space, because I do a lot of phone consultations for people about food and I've been getting tons of emails. Oh my gosh, I can't get all the ingredients for pup loaf anymore. I'm having a really hard time finding gizzards. I'm having a hard time finding liver. Uh, the, the prices are through the roof. And so for a lot of clients, we've had to to reinvent things a little bit. And particularly if you're in the city, uh, keeping some freeze dried food, you know, the, the, the freeze dried raw in your, in your cupboards for that. I can't get the fresh ingredients right now or finding a high quality canned food that you could get behind. I've had some people actually have to go to kibble feeding, which we're really against, but I can give them a couple of brands that are, you know, at a different level than the, the main pack. Um, and so sometimes we've had to bend our rules a little bit. And we also, if we can't get those ingredients, people 
will, you know, say, what can I substitute in for this? And I will give them some ideas. But frankly, um, it was interesting. I did an a interview with Emma Rutherford and she had a woman who called her and said, I'm not going to get a ch check for any I will have no money. I have two dollars to live on for the rest of the week. I can't go out and buy anything, and I'm in lockdown. What do I do? And so they went through her pantry and said, "Well, what do we have here that your dogs can eat? Well, canned pumpkin. Okay, great. Eggs, great. Uh, sardines, great. Sometimes, again, you've got to bend your rules. Mm -hmm. Whatever you have that's fresh food is." still going to be okay and don't worry about the fact that it might not be balanced for a few meals yeah. or it might not be balanced for a couple of weeks. It's okay. They're not going to die. I've had people feed yeah. really horrible unbalanced diets for years and their animals are still bouncing around the, the yeah. exam room. So um, don't get so stressed about it. Just look at it and say, well, what, what could I possibly put together that my animal would find tasty and it's still going to be nutritious? Um, you know, I've got one little dog right now. It's got something going on. And the only thing that this dog has eaten for two weeks is plain Cheerios. It, it, obviously not what I would choose for this dog to eat, but hey, it does have a vitamin mineral mix thrown into it. And it's the only thing the dog will eat until we get this problem solved. So sometimes you have to bend the rules and it's okay. Like, don't stress yourself out and think your dog's going to die or your cat's going to die because you didn't feed them the exact perfect thing for a couple of weeks. I, I would also like to add that if you are one of the millions of people that have had to switch from a better quality food to a lesser quality food, or from the really expensive dehydrated freeze dried to kibble, I can't I can't tell you the number of people that have the depression isn't coming from virus or social unrest. Depression is coming from the fear they have and the guilt they have of not being able to afford the foods they used to buy for themselves and their animals. And my suggestion is, oh my goodness let yourself off the hook. As Dr. Judy said, the body's incredibly resilient. And we all have, I think about my college years and I ate trash for eight <laughs> years and lived to tell about it. I like lived on ramen noodles for eight years. Not a good idea, but I'm here. You know, I, I, I'm, my body's resilient. Sometimes um, when we switch to, let's say, let's say that you're a person that used to feed a free range, organic, eth ethically sourced human grade raw, and now you're feeding kibble. First of all, let the guilt go and open up your fridge and think about, okay, I've got some dented blueberries that are going bad. I can pop those bad dogs in. You can take 20% of the kibble out and you know you can open up your fridge and say the top and bottom of, of those carrots, the, the butts of the carrots, I don't like that. I'm gonna chop them up real fine and pop them in. Hey, I have a can of canned salmon. I know that kibble's low on omega-3s. So I'm gonna throw that, you know, a tablespoon of canned salmon in. You can go through your seeds. Seeds are one of the best sources of, of magnesium. And magnesium is something that I think Dr. Wilcox will talk about. Most humans in North America are magnesium deficient. So we should all be munching on seeds. And you know, if you're phytate sensitive, you can soak your seeds and give them to your dogs. Seeds are fantastic. Like pumpkin seeds are raw pumpkin seeds, fantastic training treats. So you can actually swap out some of those really expensive treats you were buying for basic things that you can find in your pantry, like seeds and nuts. Um, and if, you know, I chop a Brazil nut up and I use that as training treats all day because now all my critters and myself are getting my selenium requirement. And I happen to have two pounds bulk in my pantry and I'm not leaving the house. So you can actually modify treats and whole dry goods for yourself and your animals and actually end up saving money. But I think above all, remove the guilt from off of your plate. There's enough going on right now that the last thing you need is food shaming or food guilt or fear surrounding food. So I, I do think that we can utilize a lot of what's in our pantry and maybe that's outside of our scope and our box of what we've ever done, but now's a good time to try it out. 100%. I'm really glad everybody said that because that's exactly what I was hoping everyone was going to say. And I, and I feel, um, you know, if, if you can't, even if you can, if you're not allowed to go into places and you, and you do have a car, what Billy said is like, take your dog and go in the car and go for a drive in the, in, in yeah. like open your windows, drive through fields, drive through forests, and when, and know you're doing your best. I, I remember um, uh, talking to someone once and I was taking an herb and I was, it was like, you might have even been giving it to me. <laughs> um, it was horrible. Like I, I, I was literally gagging when I was, when I was taking it. And then it's like, okay, what's the energy, what, what's, what, what's my energy around this taking this? 
And I started reading about just the energy that you put into food, right? Like when you're preparing it and, and, and totally when you're preparing it for your animal. So if you're used to preparing like these, this organic, amazing stuff, and then you're feeding it and you're going, Oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, I'm giving this, it's not balanced or it's yucky or it's processed or it's whatever. And that whole energy is going on to your animal too. You're giving it a bowl of your fear too as well. Right. So I, I really believe that like try to be as prepared as you possibly can, but, but really, really give yourself a break that, that you're doing the best that you can possibly do. And the fact that your dog and your cats are still with you. And, you know, we talk about stress hormones and oxytocin, right? Like oxytocin is the love hormone. And, and when we know that we can, we can, um, utilize that with our animals. When we look at them, it's, it's free. It costs nothing. You, that the, the oxytocin loop when, and with a gaze of someone that you love. Um, I know that when I look at every single one of my animals from a duck to my horse, to my dogs, to my cats, I, I feel that I feel like I feel their love. And now we know for sure that they feel our love. So even taking that time of having that moment and breathing together and gazing with each other, is going to make a, a massive change if you're worried about their diet like on a cellular level, right? So like try to, try to balance everything. And, and just like Dr. Becker said, and, and Dr. Morgan, like we got to, we have to the do the best we can and know that, that our animals know we're doing the best that we can yep. and, and they appreciate that. Yep. Absolutely. Dr. Wilcox, would you say that, that these all translate onto the human side as well? Are there things that we could prepare or, or utilize during times of lockdown that can help us nutrition wise to stay focused, stay positive, reduce stress? Yeah, I think that, um, you know, a big part is when I was talking earlier about emotional eating, it's like, so it's really with emotional eating, it's not a moment of emotional eating, it's what you're doing before. And if you can start every day, I mean, we all hear that, like a really good, healthy, nutritious breakfast. Um, but if you're getting in a good amount of protein and a good amount of fat in the morning, you're going to help your blood sugar levels be more stable throughout the day. And part of it when it comes to emotional eating too is thinking to yourself, all right, maybe I can eat this right now. And if I really want that food, you know what, I can have that in a couple of hours. So not having that restriction there, I think allows for people to be a little bit okay with being more present with what they're eating. And if they really want that chocolate bar, then they can say, all right, I can have that in a couple of hours. Right now, I'm going to make sure I get, you know, food that's good, uh, high in protein, high in fat, that's going to... The big thing with that too is that carbohydrates uh, digest really quickly. And so um, fat and protein hang out in our stomachs longer. And so they keep us satiated longer, which is what essentially you want. Um, and our blood sugar remains stable. So for all of those reasons, um, having like um, Dr. Becker was talking about the choline and the eggs, but eggs is you know a great thing and really, really quick to have for breakfast, um, has a good amount of fat, has a, an okay amount of protein, um, you know, and nuts as well. She was talking about, Dr. Becker was talking about seeds. So nut butters are really good. That's always a really great snack to kind of grab that you can take a couple spoonfuls of nut butter if you want. You don't have to prepare anything. Um, you can put it on a banana, an apple, you know, any kind of fruit, whatever you want. Um, so looking at foods that are going to be high in protein, which are, you know, fish, meats, etc. You can do protein powders if you're, you know, vegetarian or vegan, um, different uh, vega, pea protein powders. Um, but starting off breakfast, uh, really essentially it being the bigger meal of the day, most research is showing, I know a lot of people are, are into intermittent fasting now, and they're tending to eat a heavier dinner still in the evening and then just not eating for most of the morning. But research actually shows that it's better for us to be eating a bigger breakfast in the morning and then eating less throughout the day. And that allows us to kind of go to bed with uh, no food in our stomach. So it's digested and we can expend our energy while we're sleeping, essentially on rebuilding, restructuring, renourishing, regenerating uh, our body to fuel us for the next day. So all of those are um, really important. And uh, when it comes to foods for stress, you want to think about what foods help to support 
uh, progesterone because essentially our stress hormone cortisol is made from progesterone. So uh, foods like flaxseed, uh, yams, sweet potatoes, sesame seeds, which you can find in tahini or hummus, um, all of these things are really, really helpful to help boost up progesterone, which essentially when that pool of progesterone gets bigger, that allows a great, so when we use up stress, when we're stressed and we use up cortisol, that draws from our progesterone pool. So um, keeping that progesterone pool as strong as we can and as full as we can is key and that's often why a lot of women when they're stressed uh, it'll it'll start affecting their cycles and they'll see that um, because it's going to start affecting these sex hormones yeah. thank you Billy what fermented foods could people use because if fermented foods don't have to be in a in a ones that don't have to be in the freezer or the fridge let's say that that what Karen was saying like a share a sherry thing like, I know, like with sauerkraut or, you know, what could we, what would translate for us in our animals? Well, I, and I think, you know, the start of that question is, you know, this is something that we're all learning from as well. So, hey, maybe it's time to prepare in the future for, you know, if something like this happens again by, you know, stocking up on some of the things that you're talking about um, or stocking up on some of the things that you can just keep in your house. Um, in case this happens in the future, when it comes to fermented foods, um, the cool thing about fermented foods is, you know, you can go ahead and purchase them, you can make them at home, but a lot of the stuff is easier than a lot of people think. So, you know, it's very cheap and easy, you know, to brew your own kombucha um, and to do that, you know, every week. And by the time you, you know, get into the habit of doing that, let's say, um, you're talking about, you know, I brew a gallon and a half of kombucha a week, and it takes me one hour of total time uh, throughout the whole process. And that is for, you know, me and my wife and the dog, that's, uh, you know, a bottle of kombucha a day, essentially. And so that is, even in just doing that right there, you're talking about, you know, flooding your body with antioxidants, you're talking about all those B vitamins, you're talking about that healthy yeast and bacteria. You know, another good example of that too is fermented vegetables. Um, so that, it, that's kind of a double whammy because not only do you have all of these vegetables and you're talking about pre-processing them. So you're talking about reducing, you know, the overall sugar content. So going back to um, the doctor's yeah. point about blood sugar and, and, you know, having that not be necessarily an issue, but also there you have not only the vegetables themselves, which, you know, you can keep, usually you want to, you know, keep them in the refrigerator so they don't, you know, sort of, you know, potentially explode or something like that but um you also get the juice as well so and that's obviously something you can share if you're fermenting beets and you have beet kvass from that that's a great thing to share with your animal or if you have sauerkraut juice or something like that you know there's a lot of ways that you can incorporate all sorts of fermented foods and whether that's you know buying it or making it depending on what your budget is or what you know you want to put in or your skill level is um everyone can kind of do that. And that's, that's a healthy step we can all take. And it's also I, something I, we can do. Yeah, I was, was going to say, you know, one thing um, besides training my cat, um, with what I did for three months over COVID, I trained, <laughs> I, I, I just have, I just, I now just a cat trainer. <laughs> um, and I just walk around the house and wait for them to exhibit behaviors that I can mark. So um, yeah, um, that I've accomplished absolutely nothing. But as you can see, it's working. She's like, all right, what's next? So um, hopping through hoops is what I'm doing next, right? Are you a circus kitty? But in addition to what Billy was mentioning, spinach and beets are actually really high in folate and folate helps release dopamine. Dopamine is that feel good calming hormone. So fermenting, if you have fermented foods that have beets or spinach, those are both really safe veggies you can feed. Kitties won't eat them for the most part, if they're <laughs> fermented, but dogs will. So if you have specifically fermented foods that are higher in folate, that's a great way to nourish your, uh, to get a little free dopamine kick, and as well as the GI benefits of fermentation and building your pets or your own microbiome. So I'm a and big, big, new. big on dopamine. Yeah. And what Billy was saying like new habits, right? Yeah. Like, like, you know, being part of the process of learning how to ferment foods. And if we're in lockdown and can't get out you were good you can train kitties and people can yeah. learn how to, <laughs> how to ferment ferment um and make sauerkraut awesome. can i mention as well uh very quickly you know when we talk about new habits too i think you know when it comes from a behavioral side of things 
old habits are great as well. And what I mean by that is I travel a lot for work. Um, and so I'm leaving my dog a lot. And every time, uh, luckily she likes uh, my wife better than me, but she does <laughs> like me at least a little bit. So uh, when I get out my suitcase, I notice her ears go back just a little bit um, because she knows that I'm leaving. And there's certain things I can do to try and make her, you know, feel more special to try and make her, you know, deal with that a little bit more. And so if you have some habits like that, that you already maybe, you know, are, are dealing with, those will be good to initiate when you have to go back to work or when you have to be, you know, gone a little bit more. Yeah. Can we talk a little bit um, about fear and the stress that comes along with uh, Dr. Judy, you touched on this a little bit, people not being able to feed a balanced diet. So quite a few people wrote in Colleen um, and a couple others. She says, how can we remove the fear that we are not feeding a raw balanced diet? Listen, I, I have clients that'll come in and, you know, like every time an, a client comes in, we ask what they're feeding. And I once had a client that said, I put raw hamburger in my dog's bowl. I'm a raw feeder. I said, that's great. What do you add to that? What do you feed with that? Nothing. That dog had been on raw hamburger for two years. That is like the worst diet ever. Um, I have another one. She fed raw hamburger and, oh, sorry, cooked hamburger and carrots for two years. Mm -hmm. The dogs are still alive, guys, you know, and, and their blood work looks pretty good because their body is really good at maintaining homeostasis, uh, which is everything on an even keel. Um, I don't recommend it, but oh my gosh. And think about how we eat. How many of you got up this morning and ate a balanced breakfast that included every vitamin and mineral that your body needs for the day? How many of you are going to sit down and figure out a balanced meal for lunch and a balanced meal for dinner? I haven't even had breakfast yet. So um, we don't do that for ourselves. And frankly, if your pediatrician said, here, here's a box of human kibble. It's got, you know, the Cheerios. It's got all the vitamins and minerals that your child needs for the whole day. This is all you're supposed to feed ever. Don't ever add anything to it. You'll unbalance it. I mean, that's the fear. It's a big myth and it's the fear that's been placed into us. But if somebody, if a pediatrician told you to do that with your child, you would say, I'm getting a new pediatrician because you are out of your ever loving mind. But that's what we've been told to do with our pets. And the, the veterinary community and the, the big pet food companies have insisted for so long that every meal that goes into the bowl must be 100% complete and balanced, never vary from that routine. Um, and it's, it's put the fear of God into people and it, you, you don't have to think about how you eat and think about over the course of a week, you're, if you're eating fresh, good meats and vegetables and you're covering kind of all the different food groups, you're doing okay. Are we deficient in some things? Like Karen says, yes, we're, we're probably all a little deficient in vitamin D. We're getting better because we can get outside now in the sun. But there are certain things we can be deficient in. But don't stress over having it 100% complete and balanced every meal. And I do see this on a lot of raw social media sites where people get really nuts and really want to make you feel guilty if you don't have it perfect every single time. Mm -hmm. And I speak out against it because I, I think, we, we, first of all, we should never guilt or shame people into thinking that they're doing something wrong because every one of us is doing the best that we know how with what we have available to feed our pets and your pets are grateful and your pets are doing just fine. So um, yeah, don't be, don't be afraid of that. Don't be afraid of that. That was, that was fantastic. Anyone else? I, well, I think, I think that, um, the majority of people that are asking that I think are already trying to be more conscientious than, mm -hmm. than the average person, right? Mm -hmm. So the people that are saying I'm freaking out that it's not balanced. I think there's different levels of that. I feel like for me, when I say to people, what's your lifestyle like? Because if your lifestyle is you're waking up in the morning and you're running out the door with a commercially based shaken up smoothie and you don't have time to balance your breakfast and whatever a little bit the same holds true for our animals right like do we have time to sit and do what the best that we can to make it as best as balanced as we can because if we don't then 
for me, I just tell people then, well, then just buy something that's balanced. Just make sure it's balanced so that you're not stressing yourself out going, oh my God, it's not balanced, but, but you don't have time to balance it. Right. So it's, I think it's more functional. So functionally how I know lots of people that feed their animals better than they feed themselves. Mm -hmm. Right. Because we don't, (laughs) um, and that's, and why is that? Because we're going out and we're purchasing a really, really good raw food diet that's that has a lot of information's gone into it and it's balanced and it's oriented. So we're we're actually ten steps higher than what we're doing for our, our own bodies. So I think I think that I understand what Dr. Morgan says because I I I I feel that that is the prime way to do it. I I feel like looking at their meal every single day and and eventually making sure that it's balanced if you have the time the energy and the and the knowledge to do that i think it's awesome but if you don't and you're rushing around and you're giving them raw hamburger and carrots it, you know is that what you want to do and be doing with them when he still if he hope, hopefully makes it till they're 10 right i would just be at that point, if I was really that worried about being balanced, I would just be purchasing something that is balanced so that I'm not worrying about it again, because we're all stressing out about it. So I think, I think if you're not going to have the time to balance it over the course of, let's say I'm going to use seven days, I'm just going to say that if we're not going to pay that attention to the detail of balancing it, then I think we should look at something that is more balanced and fresh. If we can, awesome. Then, then, then jump on it. But I agree with Dr. Morgan. You shouldn't be freaking out that that you're not balancing it exactly correctly. And if you are, then 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 maybe look at adding something to it that does balance it. Yeah, yeah. I I would I would just add puppies. Um, you know, once we have a skeletal system that is, you've banked enough vitamins and minerals, um, and that's you know when when mammals are born, there is not a it, it, our skeletal system really is a nutritional bank. And when, when babies are born, they don't have, they've not made enough nutritional deposits to build this unbelievable bank that you can take withdrawals from for the rest of your life. So growing up, growing animals, I do think it's important to make sure that you're in the ballpark, especially when mm-hmm. it comes to some of the major minerals like calcium and phosphorus ratio. We know that if you guess on that and you guess wrong, you can have lifelong skeletal problems because of guessing incorrectly. So I do think it's important to pay more attention to growing babies because you want to make sure that you're in the ballpark so that you're not under or overnourishing, which can be a problem. But I agree with what everyone has said, that once you have a skeletally mature animal and you are aware of the vast majority of nutrients that dogs and cats need, and there's a lot of them, um, you know, trying to meet mineral requirements, like for zinc, zinc is a hard go. It doesn't, I mean, you could feed four pounds of liver and you're never going to meet zinc requirements. You can feed eyeballs and teeth and meet zinc requirements pretty quick. A lot of people don't want to feed eyeballs and teeth. So then you're left feeding oysters. And that's cool if you can afford, oh, I can't even, I mean, who can, who can afford oysters right now? So you're left becoming really creative with trying to meet zinc requirements. And it totally can be done and you don't have to do it every day. But if you have a growing baby, you want to make sure you're in the ballpark for some of these really critical nutrients to make sure that you're investing in their skeletal bank of minerals that that is uh, sufficient enough that your animal can then make withdrawals for the rest of their life. So for me, it's more about being in the ballpark as a growing animal than making up, waking up every day and making sure that you're neurotically balancing. That's where food fear controls us. And then we end up saying, never mind, I'm just going to feed an ultra processed diet. And food should never have that much fear control over us or anything that we're caring for. So I think part of it is having the knowledge base, as Julie said, having the knowledge base to know you're in the ballpark. And once you know that you can relax into, I didn't get it today, but I'm going to catch it next week because I have a shipment of teeth and eyeballs coming. Yeah. Dr. Wilcox, you wanted to add something there too. Yes. I think that, you know, a a big part in all of this is having self-compassion. 
you know, so, and, and really taking a bird's eye view of what, what have you done in the long run for, for your animal's life or for, for your life um, and the nutrition that you've given and the work that you've done over the time. I mean, we're in a global crisis, we're in a pandemic. So, you know, we, it's really important for us to have self-compassion knowing that yeah. you, know, you are trying your best and it's easier said than done, but, you know, practicing self-compassion on a regular basis is something that, um, is it, it just pro provides you with emotional resilience and strength and um, can make it you can just be easier on yourself right because we're our own worst critic so just being easier on ourselves in terms of what you're able to feed and afford for your animals your kids for you what have you if you're off the wagon for a little bit you can get back on the wagon yeah yep. right it's, it's so it's i hope everybody can can um listen to the last the last lecture because Carl Safina talks about about that with with in animal families yeah. you know like like all of this stress that we put upon ourselves as human beings that's just not in existence in 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 families right like we, we create so much of this within our own within our within our human existence right it, it it it's yeah we have so much to learn from our animals and, and like look how much we're learning right now if it wasn't for our animals we wouldn't even be here yeah. <laughs> it's just, you know absolutely okay we've got a question here from janine uh a couple other people wrote in as well and she said even though dogs and cats are carnivores do you believe that they need fruits and vegetables, especially to assist us now during times of stress? Why don't we start, Billy, why don't we start with you? Um, that's a great question. Uh, you know, I, I get this a lot <clears throat> and I think that people t tend to overgeneralize it. Um, cats are a different type of carnivore than dogs are, um, but it's always a sliding scale because there's this debate. Are they <clears throat> omnivores? Are they carnivores? But carnivore doesn't necessarily only mean something eats meat, and that's a common misconception. Um, it also means that they might eat a small amount of plants. And, and dogs and, you know, wild dogs and wolves do this in the wild all the time. Um, they are eating, obviously, a majority of things that are made of animals. And this actually makes sense because of the fact that the, the easiest way to break this down is, you know, dogs or dogs in the wild are seeking nutrients that are already like their body. So it's like the, the plant versus animal protein debate. You know, you might eat wheat and it has, let's say five grams of protein per serving and an egg might have six, but the egg, the way the amino acids lay in that egg are going to be more similar to your body. So you're going to need a lot less protein than you would eating that, let's say plant protein or something like that. So I think the the main thing is we know through studies that adding plants to a dog's diet uh, reduces their likelihood to have cancer. We, these aren't things that are really, in my opinion, up for debate, but I think the amount in the type is, you know, up for debate as well. So using plants for what they're good at being used for in a dog's diet um, or, you know, a cat's diet. So let's say it's a cat's diet, you know, being on the formulation side, cats do great with insoluble fiber from plants, right? And so, and on the dog side of things, let's use plants for what they're good for, for phytonutrients, for antioxidants, and for fiber. The problem is when you try to flip that and say, hey, let's use it for protein or fat, because their that, that isn't really how their body is supposed to work. So, you know, the evidence is there. I, I hear a lot that, you know, dogs can't digest plants. That's just not true. Um, they absolutely can digest plants. Um, and so... For me, um, and, and again, this can be, again, you, you really don't have to get stuck in the details here like we just sort of talked about, but my good rule of thumb is, you know, you want that to be somewhere below 7% or less of their total diet and um, adding things like, you know, as mentioned, fermented vegetables, these things can get fresh food into the bowl. Um, let's just keep it at what I would consider to be, I guess, a biologically appropriate amount of those ingredients. Anyone else have anything to add? Can we, can we introduce fruits and vegetables, especially during times of stress to help? 
I, I would say yes, but I, I completely agree with everything Billy just said. Yeah. I think it's important to choose low glycemic. You know, we know that there are some there are some veggies and fruits that have higher polyphenols, higher antioxidants, higher roughage content, higher insoluble fiber, which is exactly what we want to feed the, the microbiome of our animals without adding in, with denying our pets, actually, I would go on to say, denying our pets those substances that only come from fruits and vegetables, including the list that Billy just gave, the research is pretty clear that the microbiome is not as balanced or as healthy or as resilient when we deny animals polyphenols, antioxidants, and a source of roughage that specifically nourishes those um, you know, short, short chain fatty acids in our pet's colons. Um, so I think that choosing the right fruits and veggies is important and avoiding high glycemic starchy fruits and veggies, which is going to you know, feed the excitatory, yeasty, inflammatory pathways or not. There are good carbs and there are bad carbs. And I would say right now during stress, focus on the low glycemic, high polyphenol fruits and veggies would be my suggestion. Great. Shall we move on to our last question? It's I, was a, just, I was just gonna say with Dr. Billinghurst, what, what he said at the beginning of his, of his recording mm -hmm. was trying to feed, feed them how they're built. If, if, we're, if we're close enough to feeding them how they're built, then their bodies will deal with stress how their bodies are supposed to deal with stress from a dog and cat's perspective. So when, when we think about that, I always, I've been really lucky. And I mean, I know our dogs aren't wolves and they're not what, but I, I was lucky to watch um, a bunch of coyotes that are, that are much more domesticated than, than wolves. And for many, many years in BC, and when you look at, I, I think it is important to feed what exactly what Karen and, and Billy said, because I, I feel like, we can't get the eyeballs. We can't get like, we, we aren't allowed to process food. Some people can, but the majority of raw food out there, we're not getting the fiber from their fur. We're not getting the fiber from the guts of their prey. We're not getting the fiber from, we're not getting all of the extras, the enzymes, all that stuff that they would be getting if they ate a whole mouse or a whole rat or a whole squirrel. So, so adding the, the things that that would most replicate what they might be getting from a whole food diet would be or a prey diet would be something that I would be looking at as well but when what everybody's saying that right now with the pandemic just I would be adding things like that just because of antioxidants and stress stress levels and things like that just to be sure that you're we're covering that especially if people have to go back on dry. If they have to go on dry, I would be feeding green vegetables and, and adding as much fresh fruit and vegetables on the, on the low sugar levels as, a, as I could if, if you do have to go back to a less quality food or a dry food. I, I just have a question for Dr. Wilcox. Um, the, there's been studies in, in, for dogs specifically that when they go on an 80-10-10, kind of a, a prey model diet with no veggie, that their microbiome after three months crashes. My mama has squamous cell carcinoma. And interestingly, she's 80 and she's too thin to fast. So three of her oncologists have suggested doing the carnivore diet. And my mama just completed four weeks of the carnivore diet and it has transformed. Her, her cancer status went from her squamous cell carcinoma antigen went from 10 to zero in four weeks. Dramatic improvement with her inflammation in her body. However, her microbiome crashed badly. So my question, Dr. Wilcox, to you is when it, so fruits and veggies, you know, they're choosing the right ones for pets. I think all of us are the pet space. We get that. Can you talk a little bit about human microbiomes and how um, sometimes, you know, maybe foods like all meat that don't contain adequate fiber, how maybe for short term, that would be a good idea, but long term, like what are your thoughts on roughage and human microbiomes and some of these kind of trendy diets that are fiber deficient? What are your feelings on that? Yes, um, I do have a few, um, quite a few people that have done the carnivore diet and tried it and uh, to great success. Um, 
my thought that I take with all diets and I've, I'm one of those people that have literally, I've, I've done carnivore, I've done vegan, I've done keto, I've fasted, I've tried everything. And it's more so to see how I feel when I do it, what is optimal for me. And everybody's a bit different. Um, but part of what I look at is to say, okay, what, you know, essentially what would our ancestors have done? before everything changed, you know, um, with technology. And so we would have gone through periods, which is why I'm a big um, advocate of fasting uh, for certain people anyway. Um, we would have gone through periods of scarcity. We would have gone through periods of abundance. So there would have been times when we just had meat. You know, we would catch game and have that for a period of time. And then you would only have roughage for a period of time. So um, when it comes to sort of overall diets, I think acutely for periods of time that you can have, it's kind of like with fasting, like fasting, you can have great, you know, um, the results kind of start at 12 hours and then 13, 14, 24, 48, 72. So three days is a good period of where you kind of gain momentum and you're having all these extra added benefits to the longer you're going with fasting. And then after the 72 hour mark, you're looking at um, just kind of maintaining those benefits. And I think when it comes to carnivore diet or the keto diet, which is a big fad too, all of these diets um, that are lower in roughage um, and even ones that are, it's about doing, you know, kind of really, it really depends on what is right for that person. And mm -hmm. I think that if you are, I guess, in tune, and if you're kind of paying attention again to what your body needs, um, then being able to say, okay, maybe I'm great to do the carnivore diet for a number of weeks or maybe a month. And then you go a week with doing something else. I've seen a lot of people have benefits, um, you know, that have, uh, have, have been um, in a cataxic state, um, have been starving, um, low, low weight and doing carnivore diets. I've seen them do better as, as you mentioned with your mom. Um, and then to cut, and, and, the thing is, is you're cutting out all of these foods too. So you're getting in those amino acids, you're getting in a lot of nutrients with the carnivore diet. But I think it's all, it's all about that moderation. It essentially comes back to that place of doing something for a period of time and then trying something else. And I've seen people where they'll do amazing on the keto diet, the carnivore diet, and then I'll get them just to see, we'll do like a week or 10 days of vegan. And they feel e like e usually equally as good or even better. So, you know, that's where, you know, it comes into play of like the whole controversy of eating meat and not. Um, but I think there's, there's benefits to both. And I think it depends on how long you're doing something for and what state your body is actually in. And so, you know, we could talk about this forever. If somebody's in a chronic, you know, uh, infectious state, uh, if they've got a lot of yeast build up in their gut, a lot of bacteria uh, build up in their gut, um, generally those people are going to do much better on a carnivore or a, a keto diet. Um, mm -hmm. And then kind of transitioning as those levels decrease and the gut flora rebalances, um, transitioning more into more roughage. And so it really is kind of individual where you're at, but I do think that doing any kind of diet for a long, long time is, uh, you have to switch it up. And it's like we were talking about before, I think Billy, you were mentioning about eating seasonally, eating locally. Um, it's important, I think, to switch it up and base it on sort of where you're located on the globe as well. Rochelle, could that, could that be um, like with Karen's mom and the microbiome going, like leaving or, or, or trashing that part of it? I'm wondering if, because we're talking a lot about with SIBO, right? And fiber and, and the overgrowth of, of bacteria in the small intestine mm -hmm. and how fiber contributes to that, right? The, the abundance of fiber actually contributes to the bacteria. Mm -hmm. So if, if your mom went on a carnivore diet and it decreased her, her, small intestinal bacteria overgrowth, which they don't really look at when you look then at the microbiome, they're looking often at the lower part of the bowel. Yeah. So that could have declined because of the lack of bacteria, but maybe her bacteria load or her, her um, protozoa or whatever, like, like transient bacteria, Bacterias and things that were if her on a much deeper level, her body not being able to work with the cancer, maybe that load went down, yeah. right? Like the, the small intestinal load went down and then it affected the, the, the outcome of, of, the, of the test 
but actually made her body stronger in yeah. order to be able to fight the cancer. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah, it's, it, we're just on the tip of the iceberg yeah. with all this, aren't we? Yeah. Totally. Yeah. So cool. Uh, so we've got about a hundred questions in the chat there. <laughs> Dr. Becker, I'll stop, asking, I'll stop asking questions. No, 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 no. It's fine. It's totally, it's totally casual. It's what we're here to do. Uh, Dr. Becker and Billy, could you each really quick before we finish this session, people want to know, please name four of these foods that you're talking about. Um, fruits and veg that we can introduce to help. Oh, well, blueberries come to mind because uh, I love them. And there's been actually some research done on dogs and blueberries and endurance and uh, phytonutrients are there. So blueberries are probably, and they're like perfectly portioned. They're like the perfect size. So I'm a big blueberry girl because most dogs enjoy them. Those beautiful purple colors are passed right up the food chain and those polyphenols are there. So I mean, blueberries would probably be my top choice when it comes to perfect portions. Easy, you can put them in a treat bag. They're ready to go. They're dry. They don't get mushy. So, um, and they're pretty easy to find and they're easy to find organic if you're able to afford that. Billy, what's your favorite go-to low glycemic fruit? Um, well, I, in terms of fruit, um, <clears throat> I think uh, kind of piggybacking on what you're talking about, I, I tend to, you know, in my own diet, I tend to eat a lot of um, animal products, but I also eat a lot of, you know, like, you know, apples and bananas and, and things like that. So, you know, incorporating your dog into your lifestyle, I think is, is something we can all do. And I think that's the best way to add variety um, in order to do that. I will say my dog's favorite um, fruit on, on the planet is uh, my wife eats raspberries with raw cream and her eyes never get wider than when she gets to eat raspberries <laughs> with raw cream um, in terms of doing that. But, you know, other than that, with people are always wondering about safety with vegetables. Um, you can, you know, pretty much do most things. So, you know, if you're talking about, especially on the fermented side, but if you're talking about, you know, carrots, green beans, beets, all of these things are totally appropriate. Just keep in mind that when, when you're feeding them, a lot of times you have to do what humans have been doing since we've been humans, which is liberate those nutrients. Mm -hmm. Some of those, some of those vegetables are just going to come out whole on the other end. So whether that's through fermentation or just chopping them up, you have to find a way to get those nutrients into a usable state. But, you know, the one I always see, you know, people talking about dogs and cats not eating is onion. But, you know, aside from a very short list, mostly everything is okay. Yeah. Thanks, Billy. Dr. Judy, do you have any? Uh, well, I agree with everything that they've said. I, I tend to use, uh, I use a ton of mushrooms in my diets because I think they're yeah, so, nice. so good for gut health and um, just a lot of reasons that vitamin uh, that uh, mushrooms are really good for our pets, um, but most pet though again they should be gently cooked or somehow processed to really release the good nutrition out of them. Um, I for you know treats that are low glycemic green beans work for a lot of dogs. My dogs will sit and eat a salad, so uh, we can kind of go through just about anything. Uh, I tend to use some of, I, I love asparagus for its yeah. draining effects. Um, and it's a low glycemic. We'll use uh, cauliflower, broccoli, Brussels sprouts in our foods. I love beets. Um, so it's, I, I, I stay away th from things that are starchy. And uh, so I'm not a big fan of legumes and potatoes. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you everyone for joining us during this session. I'll post the link to the next session in the chat. Um, it was super informative. I know we all learned a lot and the recording is gonna be available for everyone shortly after the event. Thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you to our speakers. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thanks Julie for doing this. Thank you guys for showing up or I wouldn't have been able to do it. <laughs> <laughs>